Well, hello and welcome to Abba Halt Junction. Today, I'm going to quickly run you through the computer-aided railway modeler program that I use for my layout, that I use to do my design work. Um, a few people have asked about it. So yeah, I thought I'd give you a quick run through of what it's like, uh, where to get it, how to download it, and how to start off with it. Just the basics to get you going. When I first used this, um, it took me about half an hour to get to grips with it. Hopefully by watching this video for five or ten minutes, you can skip any heartache. So to go and get the software, just put SCARM into Google or any other search program that you like to use. Um, it takes you to scarm.info. There'll be a link to this in the um, program notes below, so feel free to check it out there. You then click on download SCARM. Um, and that's it. The as you can see, this little um, download bar comes up here. You just click on that and follow the on-screen instructions. Very straightforward. Um, it didn't come up with any uh, virus check or problems or anything on my computer. Um, I'm running Windows 10. Um, as you can see here, that it also goes back as far as XP. So hopefully, it can run on any um, PC version that you have. I haven't tried it on Apple. Um, so I don't know exactly how it would work on there, but for PC, very straightforward. Um, doesn't tax your computer or anything in any way, shape or form. Okay, so once you've done the installation then, as I said, it's very quick. You just click on the XE file. There's a couple of prompts. You say, yes, install. I'm not going to do it now because it deinstalls the one I've got. Um, you then, when you open the software for the first time, you come up with a blank page like this. And this is where I got stuck the first time because I started putting track on and assumed that you could move them around as you would with shapes in PowerPoint, for example. That isn't the concept you should use here. So what I'm going to quickly do, um, if you scroll out with the um, toggle button on your mouse, you'll see the scale bar changes. Um, I've ch changed this to meters, um, centimeters, but by all means you can work in inches um, feet, um, there's all sorts of uh, settings you can use. Yeah, so I'm in millimeters. Um, there is, in settings, you can change all sorts of things. Um, dimensions, for example, you can work in inches there. It's very straightforward. Um, there's many other different settings you can do. I haven't changed many of them. I just changed the settings to millimeters and 100 mil for the grid step because I thought that was a reasonable thing to to select. Okay, so when you first go in, uh, the first thing you want to do is go in and press create baseboard. I'm going to do this quite quickly, so apologies if the lines aren't perfectly straight. Obviously, when you're doing this on your own computer, you can take some time. Let's just do a two meter by one meter uh, baseboard. When you've done the three points, as you can see there, you do one, two, three. You just right click for the last one and it connects it up. It took me a while to do that the first time, I think it's quite fiddly. So that's your baseboard, one meter by two meter. Now, as I said, the key thing to this, it all revolves around start points. You don't place objects, you don't go get in a piece of flexi track like this and sticking it in place because. It's very hard, it's not very hard, but it is quite complex to move it and connect it up to pieces of other pieces of track. So what you do first is you create a start point. You press that create start point button here, new start point, and then you hold down the left mouse button and you drag it. Let's just do that again so you can see it. You drag it in the direction that you want it to go. Okay, so that this one now will as you start laying track, it will appear to the left. So I'll just delete that one for you for a second. So the first thing, I'm just going to do a quick loop of track so you can see how straightforward the um, track laying is. I've chosen as my default uh, Pico 100, but there are numerous other ones you can do from all over different parts of the world. Um, American stuff, there's Japanese, there's UK, Lego, all sorts of different track types that you can use here. 
I typically, because um, I'm a double O man and I've got Pico track, so I'm actually using the track that I'm uh, actually using on the layout. So I use Pico 100. And then this is all the list of track here. You've got then you've got your straights, buffers, all the different radius curves, and you've got different points. You've got diamond crossings, you've got Ys, and you've got a turntable at the bottom. Now, what you will see is missing from this uh, little list here. Um, I'm not entirely sure why it is, but anyway, within the Pico range, you don't get um, platforms. So I then also can select Hornby from my list of favorites, which I think is in Tools. Uh, oh, geez, it's been a while. When you first do this, you set all this up and then you don't have to go into it again then. Um, settings, tracks panel, by scale. Yeah, order automatic, favorites, libraries, five slots. Yeah, okay, so the ones you use the most are selected as favorites. So I use, as I said, Pico for my track, because that's the one I use. Um, and then Hornby is the other one I use then, because that has got platforms. So you can build up your platforms. Quite straightforward. When you have these, you can select things using the left mouse button to drag a box over it and right click and press move. Um, but I would try and not to do that as standard, particularly when you're laying track, it gets very fiddly. So let's just delete that off. Go back to my Pico 100s. I'm going to do all this in set track um, just to make it straightforward. Um, and you can see the concept. What I will say is when you are trying to close a loop, particularly if you've done some quite funky designs, it can be a challenge. And that's when I would recommend using the flex track. I'll show you what I mean by this in a second now. So yeah, so you set your start point. Everything is based off a start point. You then lay a double length track, for example, and I'm just, as I said, I'm going to do a very simple loop with the turns that you select, the curves, you have to specify whether they're going to turn left or right. So in this case, obviously, we're going to do a, an anti-clockwise loop. So my turns will be to the left. So you press left and it gives you a second radius curve. Shorthand to, to lay another piece of track similar to the one you've just done or the same as the one you've just done. You can press this uh, loop button here and you can see, oh, I've just done the baseball big enough. You get your four second radius curves and you get the, the curve or the terminating end for one of the loops done. I'm going to keep it simple. So I'm just going to do another double straight, uh, go back to my second radius curves and again press that a couple of times and lo and behold you can see there that the start point that you had has now disappeared so quite straightforward obviously you know using four second radius curves on each side and two straights it was always going to match up let's assume that you've done something a bit more funky in the middle so obviously in this case the uh, closing this loop just requires another second radius curve. But let's assume that you've been using flex track somewhere else in this loop. And it isn't a simple second radius curve that you need to close. This took me an age to do when I was first doing this. And I had a lot because I couldn't close the loops sufficiently. So as you can see here, when you close it, the start point disappears. If you don't, if you don't close it correctly, for example, let's just use the first radius in there. You end up with something like this. And when you then go into 3D, you end up with a stupidly looking gap like that. The way to get around that is, let's assume this isn't a simple second radius curve that will fill the gap. 
is to use a piece of flex track. Now the flex track they've got here, even though they specify that the length there is 90 centimeters odd, it does allow you to insert it into places like this. So you can see when you first put it down, it, it wobbles all over the shop. Put it to the start point that you want to end on and then press the button and it automatically fills the gap for you. So even though that obviously can be filled by a second radius, if we now go to the parts list. So what you'll notice here is this is the parts list that is auto generated by SCARM. Very nice function. This. It tells you all the pieces of track that you've got for your layout. And here we have two double straights. We have seven second radius curves. And then we have this flex track, which filled the gap. Now, obviously we didn't need the full 90 centimeter length. It was more like a 30 centimeter length. If you then use another piece of flex track somewhere else, it will use the remainder, the two thirds in this case, remainder that's left from this track and use it somewhere else. It doesn't just assume that you need one new piece of flex track for each time you use it. It's quite a clever, intelligent piece of um, software, I think. Very neat. Okay, so that's the basics of creating your layout. Now, once you've created your layout, and obviously generally you're gonna have more complexity than just a simple loop like this. When you get to more complex functions, there's a few other neat tricks that you can use. You can change the color, and if you double click anywhere like this, you'll notice it selects everything up to a point. If there was a point in the in this layout anyway, it would break at that point. But yes, it selects all the active parts up into a, up until a point. You can then, uh, or a turnout if you uh, prefer the American terminology, you can then turn them all yellow, for example. Double click again, and you could turn them all red. <clears throat> so yes, so there we go. That's in a nutshell how to simp do a simple loop. As you saw just earlier on, you can also press 3D and there's not much to see obviously, but it'll give you a representation of your baseboard. You can hold down the left mouse button like I am here and rotate. You can zoom in either by using control or the toggle on your mouse. You can zoom in and out of the layout. You can rotate underneath, etc., etc. And where this comes into its own is obviously when you have elevated track. So if we just quite simply here, if we double click on all of this and then press this, uh, it's quite hard to see. Okay, let's start that again. Let's double click on this. Let's turn it gray so I can see what's going on. Okay, so the last thing I wanna show you is working with elevations. Obviously this plain old flat version isn't particularly exciting. So let's take this out by pressing the delete key. And then you can see here then this gives you the option of having two start points. So we'll click on this start point here and we'll put a point in at this location. We'll just put a, an electrofrog medium radius point. Just note on the points, you can start them either at the point where it branches into two tracks or on the mainline branch or onto the curved section of the branch. So in this point here, because it's uh, a new location I want to branch out, I'm going to use this version of the... Okay, that's gone. Very good. So in this one here, I'm just going to use a medium radius electrofrog point close up this gap, just use the same technique as before. I'm not going to try using these short straights or combinations of them. I'm just going to use a flex track, put it onto the start point. You'll see the end track go green, press the left mouse button, job done. Then it automatically puts you to the next start point. You can have multiple start points, by the way. I will then use a flex track here now just to show you 
some of the um, potential that you have for tunnels and bridges. So with flex track, just while we're at it, you can choose multiple intermediate points. Yeah, to essentially get you any curve, any realistic curve that you want up to radius one. So let's just bring this track around. We'll bring it underneath the main line and then just have this crazy looped bit there. Now, obviously in 3D, you can see here with our diamond crossing, we have a problem. So what we do to remedy that is we click on the tracks that we want to raise, make sure that this little I button is selected, which allows you to type in the heights of this track. So in this case, let's just put 60. So a train can run underneath it. Now, obviously in reality, this is a crazy gradient here of 17.4%. Um, but yeah, just for demonstrations purposes only, we'll uh, show you here what that does. So that's 60, 60. Let's just have a look in 3D what that gives us. Uh, you can see it's a bit of a mess. Now the reason for that and the way we remedy that is what we can do is we can select the piece of track that we want and we can press this bridge icon. There we go. Now this means that this section of track, you may have to press it twice. This section of track as you can see, delineated by this gray outline means that it's now as a bridge. So now when we go to the 3D, you can see quite nicely, obviously the pillars will have to be placed as you want them, but you can see quite nicely that there's a bridge going over this piece of track on the base level. As I said, crazy gradient, but it uh, shows you what can be done. The alternative to this is that we take off the elevation, which you can do just by pressing this bridge icon again. And then we could put the bottom piece of track in a tunnel, which is this button here. You can see this little archway confirms what bits it will put in the tunnel. If you go into 3D then, uh, it's a bit messed up obviously because there's not much gap here, but the flex track now is going off into this tunnel and it goes underneath the line. You need more clearance than 60 mil, which is what's causing this trouble here. Yeah, worth noting that these measurements here are in your base scale. So these are millimeters. So if we raise this track to say 80, or something crazy, 80 and 80, you would then see, hopefully when we go to the 3D, that it's a bit better. Obviously the tunnel doesn't quite fit in at this location here because it's a bit wider. But yeah, it gives you a good indication of what can be done and yeah, some of the options available. So yeah, my few top tips to do, do everything using a start point. By far the easiest way to do it. If you've got points, do those first. Um, that way, you know, for example, if you just have a couple of points uh, meeting each other like this, you know, where tracks overlap or have you, you can then get those in position first. There we go. And that way, you know that there's a nice connection between the two sets of loops you have, for example. So yeah, use start points, jump into 3D every now and again so you can see what's going on. There's a couple of nice measuring tools as well. So you can check clearances and what have you between tracks. It's quite a nice thing to do. Bear in mind that when it looks like you've got quite a lot of space, sometimes when you actually come to do it in reality, there's not as much space as you think, particularly um, from for inclines. This tool does give you some indication as we saw there in the 3D on different um, how different elevations react with each other, but they have quite steep slopes. In reality, if you want these to look quite smooth and you don't want 
retaining walls or cliff edges, you need a bit more space than this thing indicates. But as an indicative tool, I would highly recommend it. Um, this is my current incarnation of my layout. Um, it's the 23rd iteration. Thanks to everyone on Facebook and YouTube who've given me lots of input into this. But as you can see, you can color different sections, you know, orange for industrial, there's a purple heritage line, there's a coal mine in black, obviously a couple of platforms, three platforms, turntable area, engine sheds in blue, then a clockwise and anti-clockwise running circuit in red and green. Tunnels here, because this end is a mountain. So as you can see, it's, um, I've got a video, and there should be a link up here somewhere. This has got multiple elevations. Um, there's a base layer, which is this zero line here. There's a 50 centimeter high section. There's a 110. Uh, these are millimeters, obviously. 110 section and a 150. There's bridge sections and what have you. A lot going on in eight foot by four foot. Um, and as I said, in reality, um, some of these gaps, even though they appeared to easily get every, all the track in, when you actually come to do it in reality, it can be a push. So yeah, sketch out what you want on paper, get this lovely free piece of software, get it all in. As I said, after about a half hour play, I knew all the ins and outs, and it was very straightforward. You can knock out iterations of, um, of your design in probably an hour. So yeah, really straightforward to use. Um, just finally, a couple of things to note, you can export your design as a JPEG, then you can put it on your website or put it on Facebook, whatever you want to do. And you can also print it off. Um, it doesn't print out the, um, the scale bar, but it's quite easy just to write down the, the key points where things transition and what have you. Yeah, it's um, very neat. As we touched on earlier on, there's a parts list. This is the parts list that I have for my uh, main layout. And as you can see here, this, as I mentioned earlier on, this flex wood part, it says 32. However, you can do it by 27 pieces. So it's a very useful, intelligent piece of software, which saves on you purchasing track. Uh, yeah. Um, I am going to try and take the output of this and put it into a little tool on my website to actually give you a cost for all of these things as well. Um, but that's a work in progress. I'll let you know when I get that done. And I'm only going to do it for Pico 100 because obviously trying to do it for all would be a, a lot of work. But yeah, that's Scarm in a nutshell. Yeah, thanks a lot for coming. Um, I've obviously done this review. Um, in response to a few people on Facebook and YouTube asking me about the software I use. Um, yeah, and I think this quick introduction will give you an overview of the power of this tool. As I said, I haven't reviewed the other ones. Um, I'm sure there's not a lot of other good ones out there. This is free. Um, I'm still in the trial version. Um, I will be purchasing the next version when I can get my hands on $30. Um, yeah, check it out. Um, I'd highly recommend it. Please leave your comments below on any experiences that you've had. And if you can fill any of the gaps that I don't understand, um, I'd really appreciate it. Thanks a lot for coming. If you haven't already, please subscribe. I've got a 100 subscriber video special, which would be a pile of bloopers that I've done. Amazingly, only five or six videos in, I've got probably five minutes of bloopers already, including a few today. <laughs> so yeah. Um, please subscribe if you haven't already. Thanks a lot for coming and I'll see you again soon at Aberholt Junction. Cheers.